Reverse, my black gay cat. Chapter 30, Probity. The kids are wary of him. It's to be expected, Jirai tells himself. They attacked, he defended, and the girl got hurt. The facts, the justification, they don't change anything. He hurt the girl who might as well be Naruto's older sister by the looks of things, and that's not going to endear him to them anytime soon. He'll admit it's a little mind-bending, though, to see eight of the nine Jinjiriki, including the bloodthirsty and murderous Yondame Mizukage, who is apparently no longer either bloodthirsty or murderous, scattered around the backyard of a small house in Kiri. Only B is missing, but his absence doesn't seem to be putting much of a damper on things. Roshi of the Lava Release, long since thought to have abandoned humanity completely, is laughing with the auburn-haired beauty from Kiri and ignoring the way Yagara is scowling at both of them, expression offended. A few paces away, Han, the Jinchuriki of the Steam, has stripped off his armor and is letting the little green-haired girl perch on one of his broad shoulders as she chatters at him. Jiraiya honestly can't think of anything but a fairy alighting on a friendly giant, and it's a disconcertingly cute image. Taking a sip of the sake their swordsman host provided, rough, strong, and definitely not something to be underestimated, Jiraiya lets his gaze slide unobtrusively over the rest of the gathering. The girl he injured is working her way through a plate of fish, quiet but at ease, with both of the fox summons curled up at her feet. Utsukata and Momiji's apprentice are keeping Naruto, entertained with a game of tree climbing near the yard's edges, and Jiraiya has to admit he's fairly impressed with how much control Naruto is already showing, especially given that the kid has just started the academy this year. Then again, given the number of shadow clones he made when he was tackling Jiraiya to the ground, the tree climbing is probably the least of what he can do. He lingers there for a moment, watching the boy who doesn't know him, the godson who's never really met him, and it hurts. Easy enough to put it out of mind when he's miles from the village, submerged in women and alcohol and whispers that might catch the Sangdami's attention. Easy to forget about Naruto completely when he's on Orochimaru's trail, gathering up the clues his wayward former friend has left behind like breadcrumbs. Harder. Now, looking at the last living remnant of the man he loved like a son, like the hope for a better world, and realizing that in all the time he spent observing him on his rare stops in Kanaha, he's never heard the boy laugh like this before. It's just unfair, he thinks a little grimly, swirling the liquor around his cup and watching it catch the light of the setting sun. Naruto should be laughing like that with Minato, with Kushina. They loved him so much even before he was born. We're so excited at the prospect of finally having a family. Two orphans, both with lonely childhoods and burdens they shouldn't have had to bear. And what would they think of Jiraiya knowing he abandoned his godson with a thin excuse that he had a duty to fulfill? Nothing good, he's sure. Thoughts of Gushina leave him no escape from the puzzle that is the man who claims to be her brother. And Jiraiya glances at where the redhead is sitting on the porch steps, a cup of tea at his elbow, and Zabaza beside him. The Kasakage's son is perched on his lap, one small hand fisted in the front of Garama's shirt, and seems perfectly content to just sit there while the adults talk. One of Garama's arms is curled around him, absent in a way that speaks of perfect comfort with the situation, and there's no way it's an act. Not a chance. Jiraiya's a damn good actor himself, and he can tell. Kurama really loves all of the kids he picked up, and that just makes him even more of a mystery. As far as Jiraiya knows, Kushina was an only child. Then again, she never talked about her family much in general. Disappeared dad, dead mother, no extended family left after Ujushia's fall. So, it's possible. Likely, even Jiraiya admits, covertly observing Kurama's face. Naruto got Minato's coloring and his mother's bone structure. Without the blonde hair to distract the eye, Kurama's resemblance to him is almost eerie, as is his likeness to Kishina herself. In temperament, too, from what Jiraiya's seen, he's surprised the man hasn't punched him for hurting the blonde girl yet. That'd have been one heck of a surprise, Jiraiya thinks Riley, stepping out of the woods in the ass end of Kiri to find Naruto rolling around on the grass with a couple of foxes. Jiraiya had been escaping an increasingly bloody rebellion. He hadn't stopped to consider any options beyond getting Naruto safely away from what had to be a kidnapping. 
The blonde girl hasn't taken kindly to it, and she'd caught Daria off guard. He'd reacted on instinct, covering himself in spikes, and heard her cry out. Right after, he'd been jumped by four little hellions out for blood. And while a lot of their win was down to shock and not wanting to injure his godson, Darius willing to give credit where it's due. They're good. And in a few years, they're all going to be terrifying. He's not going to insult the girl by offering another apology. Last time he tried, she cut him off with a sharp, I'm a shinobi. And Jiraiya takes that to mean she'd rather accept the loss, move on, and make sure it doesn't happen again. Never do that. Naruto's holding a grudge, and Jiraiya doesn't blame him. If some guy had hurt Tsunade while they were on a team, he wouldn't forget about it either. That the blonde in question is his surrogate sister and not his hopeless crush only makes things worse. He takes another look at Naruto, hanging upside down from a branch by his knees with a smiling Utikata looking up at him, clearly encouraging, clearly friendly, and sets his sake down to rub his hands over his face with a muttered curse. Saratobi is going to pop a vein. The civilians in Kanaha are self-righteous, self-centered, petty assholes, and the shinobi have forgotten to a man just who Naruto is and where he came from. So many of them knew Minato or Kashina or both, counted them as friends, and now... Nothing. Not a thought spared for making Naruto's existence easier. Not a mitigating word to their children, not a kind gesture, not a friendly smile as they pass him in the streets. Naruto's closest friend in Kanaha is the ramen cook! In light of that, is it really surprising that Naruto was latched on to the first person to show him love with such fervor? He adores Kurama, just as the other children do. Maybe even more, because there's a connection between them that's deeper than with the other kids. Kurama looks for Naruto first. Always. And Jiraiya doesn't want to put stock in such a handily convenient backstory, but... It adds credence to Kurama's story. Between that and the unmistakable Uzumaki looks, there's not much room for Jiraiya to doubt any of it. And then... Just to further the mystery, there's the fact that Kurama says WE when he's referring to the Jinchuriki as a group, even though that makes ten Jinchuriki and there should only be nine. From what Jiraiya has managed to gather, he fought Yagura in his version 2 form and not only beat him, but didn't even break a sweat doing it. There's been mention of a Shadow Jinjutsu, Akatsuki is the culprit behind it, and... That, of course, would be the other thing Jiraiya is avoiding thinking about Akatsuki and its seven members, among whom are two of his former students who is long thought dead. Nagato, it would seem, is not the child of prophecy that Jiraiya thought, or if he was, he isn't any longer. Twisted, changed, shattered beyond all recognition to the point where he's animated Yahiko's corpse as one of his six paths and is trying to conquer the world. And Conan, following as she always does, devoted to the memory of the man she loved and the dream they shared, even if it's in pieces. Compared to that, Orochimaru's presence in the group is hardly a blow at all, though Jiraiya thinks he's probably a terrible fit. Orochimaru was never one for teamwork, after all, even when they were a team. He's also self-motivated and all too self-aware. At some point, he's going to put himself above the goals of the group, and from what Kurama has said, that's not going to go over well. Even now, Jiraiya can't help but hope he escapes in one piece. A murderous bastard he may be, but he's still Jiraiya's first and greatest friend. Kurama has a plan to face Akatsuki, though he hasn't said outright what it is yet. Since he's a Nuzumaki, Jiraiya assumes it's going to be stupidly reckless, will probably contain at least one full frontal assault, and will have very slim chances of everyone involved coming out of it with all their limbs intact. He remembers some of Kushina's plays during the war, and maybe Minato was too besotted to notice that his girlfriend was utterly insane! But Jiraiya sure as heck wasn't. The quiet burble of sake being poured into his abandoned glass makes Jiraiya lift his head, and he blinks in faint confusion as Kurama settles on the grass beside his stump. The Kazekage's son is over by Naruto, as is Taki's Jinchuriki, who has scaled the tree and is cartwheeling along a narrow branch. Utakata looks a little like he wants to flail and a man should be careful, though he's otherwise holding on to his composure, keeping beneath the red-headed kid as he steps cautiously out on the branch to join Naruto. You have more bad news for me? Jiraiya asks a little suspiciously, though he can't help the wry note in his voice. 
It's a heck of a shift in his worldview, after all. The enemy he's been chasing might as well be one of his own creation. He's responsible for Nagato's ideals, after all, and his control over the Rinnegan. Without those, Akatsuki wouldn't even exist right now. Garama snorts, setting the sake bottle out of the way and picking up his own cup. Still full of tea, and if Jiraiya hadn't seen Zabaza and Roshi downing this same sake like water, he might be suspicious. As it is, he's willing to work off the assumption that Karama just doesn't like to drink for whatever reason. It's the least he can do if Karama is really who he says he is. He's failed Naruto enough. No need to drive him any further away by alienating his guardian with accusations of poisoning. You want more? Karama asks, gruffly amused as he stretches his legs out in front of him. Sorry, I think I hit all the high points already. Jiraiya has a quiet laugh, surprised at the redhead's humor, even though we likely shouldn't be. If anyone understands the implications of the news about Akatsuki, it's him. Because Akatsuki's leader took everything from me. I survived. My best friend didn't. And I want to destroy her for that. In the face of that, being able to laugh at a bad joke shows more strength than Jiraiya would have expected of him. And that doesn't even account for his kindness with the children. Jiraiya has met his fair share of revenge-driven psychopaths. As much as Jiraiya wants to paint Karama with the same brush, though, he just... Doesn't fit the bell! Think you'll be able to convince Sarutobi? Karama asks suddenly. When Jiraiya glances down at him, his eyes are fixed on Naruto with a sort of steady devotion someone else might turn towards their life's greatest work, or the center of their universe. To let me stay with Naruto in the village, I mean. That phrasing, Jiraiya thinks, and that's Rai, too. He knows very well what will happen if Sarutobi says no. Karama will take Naruto, take whichever of the brats wants to stay with him, all of them, older ones included, from what Jiraiya has seen, and happily remove himself from the world at large. He doesn't need Ganaa, and for all that Naruto wants to be Okage, and is it that a kick in the teeth hearing those words from a kid who looks like a perfect blending of both his parents and shares their dream? He doesn't have any solid ties to Kanaha that can't be worn away by time and distance. Remove Naruto from the village completely, and he'll eventually turn all of that fierce loyalty to Garama and his fellow Jinchuriki instead. For that reason alone, Jiraiya thinks Sarutobi will say yes. He's a kind old man, never one for conflicts when they can be avoided, but he's also the god of shinobi, who led Kanaha through two wars and has kept them the strongest of the hidden villages for almost 40 years. He's more than capable of smiling fondly and acting like a grandfather and still thinking of people in terms of assets to the village. That's very largely the reason Jiraiya has never particularly won in the hat. He couldn't bring himself to think that way. Minato could, and he knows Tsunade can. Analytical, careful, for the good of the greater number, with morals and sentiments set aside. But Jiraiya is too much heart and not enough brain. He'd scare himself if he tried to be like that. Orochimaru would have been the opposite, he thinks, more brain than heart. They always needed each other to balance out into one functional person, and despite everything, Jiraiya still feels a flicker of warmth in his chest at the memory of his oldest friend. Cautious and assessing, but still following the path of dreams that the whole world said were impossible. He wonders now, with a small, wry smile, just how much of himself Orochimaru still devotes to those dreams. Too much? Or has it always been not enough? Yeah, he says, feeling Karama's dark red eyes on him. Like Kushina's with the blue leached out, leaving them deep crimson instead of bruised purple. He takes a long gulp of sake to give himself a reason for the hoarse note in his voice and adds, I sent him a letter already with one of my summons. Kamakichi will head back as soon as Sarutobi lights a reply. And stops cursing long enough to give him directions, he thinks, but keeps that part to himself. The Sendame might... Act like a mild-tempered geezer most of the time, but he's got his buttons. Naruto is one of them. Orochimaru, and by extension Akatsuki, is another. For that matter, so is anything that could lead to war. It's one of the reasons the Hyuga incident ended the way it did. This situation managed to hit all three in one go, which would be fairly impressive if the thing at risk of exploding wasn't Sarutobi's head. Kurama doesn't show any visible signs of relief. 
He simply nods, taking another sip of his tea, and turns his gaze back to where the Takijin Cherokee is showing Naruto how to do a handspring. Of course, because she's a vicious little thing. Jiraiya's pretty sure he's going to be seeing spots until he dies, given the way she kept blinding him when he surprised them, and if he never as a kid, it'll be because of that truly debilitating kick to the groin she pulled off while he was reeling helplessly. The handspring is less of a handspring and more of a scything kick aimed at the face of an invisible opponent with a neat little twist and a perfect landing afterward. Judging by the fond smile on Garama's face, he sees the attack for what it is too. I think it's cute. Somehow Jiraiya's not surprised. What are their names? He asks on a whim because he's never taken the time to notice names in his travels. It was enough to know faces and to recognize that they were Jin Cherokee, so their actual names escaped him in favor of titles and allegiances. He's been listening all night, but Karama has pet names for all of them, and all the rest are too busy laughing and shouting and being rambunctious little aliens for him to make anything out. Karama makes a sound that is definitely a snicker, and which Jiraiya is just as definitely going to ignore. Well, they didn't stop to introduce themselves before they kicked your butt. He mocks, grinning. He's got a few too many teeth in it to be entirely harmless, but Jiraiya decides to take it in the spirit that it's intended and flips the reddit off. Karama laughs outright at that and waves a hand at where the kids are now all doing sounding kicks as they launch themselves into the air. If this sort of learning curve is a Jin Cherokee thing, the elemental countries are screwed if they ever decide to go after Karama. Forget what the man himself can do. Four superpowered children who soak up knowledge like sponges will be more than enough to level any village feeling stupid enough to take a swing at their adopted mother. Sabaku no Garo, Karama says fondly, and when the pint-sized redhead glances over at them suspiciously, at Yuraya, says viciously, Karama just waves a hand silently, assuring him it's fine. His father slapped an incomplete seal on him when he sealed Shikaku. Thought it would make him a better weapon. His mouth twists in derision. It backfired, and the Kaze Kage spent the last six years trying to kill him to minimize the collateral. Never mind that it's his own fault Sukaku's even crazier than before, and that he had a back door right in the Gara's head. A tip of Garama's head drags Jiraiya's slightly horrified attention away from the little boy's faint, happy smile as he follows behind Naruto and directs it towards the little blonde girl Jiraiya hurt. The Taki Jinjuriki has a hold of her hands and is laughing as she pulls the older girl to her feet. Ni Yugito from Gumo. They took her away from her family when she was two years old, so they could seal the Matatabi in her and never let her go back. She's been training since she could walk, and those assholes treated her like a miniature weapon, not a kid. Calling them brutal is too kind. She's never been allowed to decide anything. Because even if Kumo is not as bad as some places, A still thinks Jin Cherokee are weapons that owe their allegiance to the village that created them. Claude fingers tighten on porcelain and Kurama smiles mirthlessly. Sage forbid the villagers do anything to actually earn that loyalty, though. Jiraiya has a sinking feeling that there's going to be a pattern to these stories. One sharp red eye studies him, and Kurama snorts, then looks away. I assume you know about Yagura and Utakata, and that you've heard of Roshi and Han before, he says, and when Jiraiya nods, he barrels on before the other man can speak. Fuji run away from Taki more times than she could count. They kept dragging her back even though she's treated like a monster instead of the headman's granddaughter, and didn't give a damn why she wanted to get away from those bastards in the first place. When I caught up to her, two Taki Jonin were trying to subdue her. They'd hit her and grabbed her so hard she has bruises. She's ten! It takes effort not to ask what Karama had done to those shinobi while he was rescuing Fu. Jiraiya's fairly certain, he already knows, and honestly can't say he would have done anything differently. He takes a breath, takes another swig of his drink, and then says quietly, It's a bad situation all around. Fury sparks behind crimson eyes and Karama growls. The sound vibrates in his chest, rumbles up through his throat, and the air around them suddenly feels twice as thick and heavy, hot like standing too close to a fire. Kurama shoves to his feet all lethal, animalistic grace and deadly rage and snarls all around. Because it's so goddamn hard for the fucking villagers to cheat in Cherokee like human beings. Because Sage forbid they actually give a damn about the children that they sacrificed. 
You want to know how to make a monster Toad Sage? You take a child and you tell them every day that they're alive, that they don't deserve to be treated well. You whisper about them and you treat them like they're dangerous and you tell them that they'll have to earn what every single other child is born knowing. Tell them long enough that they're a monster and it's your own fucking fault that they eventually snap. With a sharp edge snarl, Kurama turns on his heel and marches over to where the kids are watching, wide-eyed. He throws himself to the ground in their midst and instantly has Naruto draped over his shoulders. Gara and Fu crawl into his lap, not even seeming to notice the corrosive red chakra blanketing him, and Yukito presses herself to his side. Utakata drifts over as well, settling himself within arm's reach, and after a moment, Yagura extracts himself from the auburn-haired woman's hold and wanders over to lean against a nearby tree. A soft chuckle comes from behind Jiraiya, but he doesn't look up as Zabaza steals the abandoned sake bottle and adds another measure to his cup. Impressive. Didn't think anyone could make Red lose his temper like that, but it only took you six words. Good job. The swordsman's mouth is curled into a knife-edged smile, just showing the edge of filed teeth, but there's something that's a step away from violence in his eyes as they fall on Karama. On the way, Roshi, too, moves closer to sit on the grass beside him. Karama tips his head and says something that makes the other redhead laugh and Yagura snort, and Zabaza's expression shifts sideways into something that hovers between appreciation and blatant want. Jiraiya's pretty good at recognizing the beginnings of an infatuation. He's put it in every single book he's written since the tale of the gutsy ninja, after all. And maybe Zabaza's not quite there yet, but he's definitely heading in that direction. It would be amusing if it weren't also slightly horrifying. Still, he's also right, and Jiraiya breathes out a sigh, rubbing a hand over the back of his neck. Yeah, he agrees, Riley. I got that impression, thanks. Zabaza snorts, then holds up the sake, offering it to Han as the big man approaches. No, thank you. Han says politely, leaning against the fence. It creaks dangerously, and he shifts his weight away from it with a faint wince. Ajahn Turgi's metabolism is too fast for us to get drunk unless we have roughly a lake's worth of alcohol to down in the space of a few minutes. I'd rather keep to something else if I'm just drinking for taste. The lack of effect doesn't seem to have hindered Roshi at all, if the six bottles Jiraiya has watched him put away mean anything. It does explain Garama's avoidance, though, if he really is a Jinchiriki the way Jiraiya suspects. That little speech didn't do much to change his mind, either. Instead of asking, though, he just lifts his cup to on and salute and drains it. More for me, then. Han looks faintly long-suffering, as though he's heard that exact line in response before. With a faint shake of his head, he turns pale brown eyes on Jiraiya and says, You should be careful what you imply about the Jinchuriki Toad Sage. You're not in company that will make many allowances for ignorance. With anyone else, Jiraiya might bristle at the warning. As it is, he simply nods, accepting the rebuke. He can learn, even if it takes him a try or two. Or three. It earns him a faint smile, more wryness than actual humor. Han turns his face away to where Naruto and Fu are turning Karama into a human jungle gem, and his smile gains depth and warmth. I've often wondered, he says, absent and more an afterthought than anything. Just how it is our villages see us. We're their creations, after all, made by their hands without any thought to our wants. But even so, they insist on seeing us as monsters straining at our chains, ready to break loose at any moment and destroy them. So they fear us, and treat us poorly, and our resentment grows. Then their fear increases, and the whispers become more vicious, and we hate them more. An endless spiral, but one that they started. One that they created, the same way they created us. It's the same with all Shinomi, Zabaza offers, and his grin is all razor-edged teeth. Maybe more, which in Turkey, but just look around. Civilians are terrified of us, How we're terrified of ourselves. We're their monsters, so they tried to kill us while we're helpless. They tried to weed us out, whittle our numbers down, and when we do it, they call us monsters. Makes sense that Shinobi have their own monsters to hate, doesn't it? The demon of the hidden mist, they call Zabaza. Jiraiya has heard other villages whisper about him. A monster, a cautionary tale. Killed his entire graduating class just because he could. But how much was because of that, 
and how much of it was to prove a point. There was never any logic behind Curie's bloody graduation ritual. It was madness from a logistical point of view, and it took the death of almost an entire generation before those in power realized that and hurriedly swept it under the rug. Zabaza's doing, and Jiraiya has never thought of him as anything but a bloodthirsty monster before this moment, which rather proves his point, doesn't it? Han hums thoughtfully, inclining his head to accept the point. An interesting thought. We are all necessary monsters, it seems. Zabaza grunts, sounding bored with all the philosophy, and rises to his fate. Not that this isn't fascinating, but if you'll excuse me, I've got a pretty firecracker to talk into a good night kiss. Tipping his sake in salute, he heads for Kurama, who's laughing at Naruto rolling around with the white back summits. With a deep chuckle, Han shakes his head. I hope he realizes he's just as likely to lose his head as get a kiss. I think that's part of the appeal for him. Jiraiya counters Riley. He refills his cup again, deciding he needs the fortification if he's going to make it through the rest of the night. There's only so many times he can get his worldview turned sideways in a single day before he starts longing for a good binging session after all. And he hasn't even heard from Saratobi yet. That's likely to require a bottle all on its own to get through. He's definitely not looking forward to it.